Um, I was just going to briefly introduce our speakers uh, on behalf of the Halloween Society. Obviously, this event is organised by the Halloween Society of Socialist Lawyers. My name is Stephen Knight, I'm the Secretary. Um, we have on our panel today, um, on the right here, Jane Fay, who is a uh, author and journalist. Uh, in the middle, uh, we have uh, Stephen... I gave you the description. <laughs> yes, you gave me the descriptions, um, but unfortunately I lost them. It's Stephen Whittle, Professor of Equalities Law at Manchester Metropolitan University, who describes himself as a bolshie bastard. <laughs> and on uh, the far left there, um, your right, uh, we have uh, Julian Norman, a barrister at Drystone Chambers, who practices in, in immigration, criminal and regulatory law. And she's also a trustee of feminism in London. And I think that Jane's going to be uh, sort of chairing the debate in a way uh, this evening. So over to that. Facilitating. I suppose we're all somewhat to his left. Um, right, Jane, are they, uh, is there any, any sort of clock anywhere around here? Hang on, Jane. Yes, because we're going to try and keep to about 10, 15 minutes. No, but I can, I can. I've got, you've got uh, first. Sorry. All right, all right. Um, yes, I'm journalist, writer, uh, focus tends to be on uh, legal and uh, politics of uh, sexuality and uh, online issues. There is a book which, to be honest, because it's about a year out now, um, if you want it, take one and give what you feel you want to give rather than uh, negotiate. Um, black and white, nice posh, lawyerly sort of thing, but because I also get up on stage and do comedy, I've got the nice pink shoes. Um, about a month ago, the Mirror had a wonderful headline, I know Mirror is the go-to paper for lawyers, um, a story of the full, bizarre list of telltale clues that a lesbian with rubber penis who duped girls into sex revealed. Um, this was the case. Now, I'm going to use names as quoted, usually in court. There is, in many of these cases, some question as to what the right name for the person is, but we'll get into that in a moment. Um, basically, the clues are that if you're going out with someone who won't allow you to see them undressed and won't allow you to put your hand on their penis, then they might be an undercover lesbian. That seems to be the, the, the thrust, thrust of the mirror story. Um, in September 2015, Gail Newland was found guilty of three um, offences on sex by deception. Uh, Tom, if you want to correct me on that, but that's fine. And as I understand, it went down for eight years. Um, an appeal was, or leave to appeal was granted last week. So that case is now sort of active again. Um, and in December 2015, Kieran. Uh, yes, that first case, Jennifer Staines received a sentence of three years. Um, whereas in December 2015, someone called Kieran Lee, um, who's a trans man, got a two year suspended sentence. And if you want to get some idea of what the differences between these sentences were and why, they seem to have to do with degree of penetration, who was penetrated with what, whether it was with a body part or with uh, an actual implement. And the motive in the case of Kieran Lee, uh, what was argued in court and accepted in court. Uh, right, yes, you could have just said that. Everyone tells me that. Um, try and talk louder, Jane. Okay. Um, what was accepted in court was that Kieran Lee um, entered into a sexual relationship because his partner had effectively said they would end the romantic relationship if Kieran didn't something sexual. So Kieran then did sex, or did sex um, by deception, because then after that his partner worked out that Kieran uh, had not been born with a traditional male body, as some would say. Um, the issue is sex by deception, conditional consent, the idea that consent only exists or remains if the partner abides by conditions laid out in advance. Although what has developed in these cases is some idea of common sense. We'll get back to that. The legal basis, the SOA, Sexual Offenders Act 2003, sets out two clauses, section 74, where 
consent occurs when someone agrees by choice and has freedom and capacity to make that choice. And in section 76, um, that choice is vitiated, is basically null and void, where the defendant intentionally deceived the complainant as to the nature or purpose of the relevant act. And that is what is absolutely the core of this, what is the nature or purpose of the act. Um, so one might say that any man who has ever fibbed about being married would fall foul of this, but not, not a jot of it. Um, and the reason that it's not just some married guy who will fall foul of this law is because of an appeal court case in 2013. We've had this rash of recent cases. In 2013, 2012, 2013, we had three other cases. One in Scotland, which effectively is under quite different legislation. But the two in England were the same sort of case uh, where somebody was held to have carried out sex by deception. Um, section 74, 76 clauses were invoked. The Scottish case, the case of Chris Wilson, under Scottish law was a fraud of a sexual nature. So in English jurisdiction, these are sexual cases which are consent is invalidated through fraud. In Scotland, it was a fraud which was about sex. Um, two English cases were that of Justine McNally, otherwise Scott McNally, and Gemma Barker. Uh, Gemma, um, Stevie, I'm trying to remember. Gemma, I think, got two years. Three years. Three years. Oh. I thought that was reduced. 30 months. 30, 30 months, months. Were in the between. Somewhere in between. Okay. But the reason that the McNally case was important was it came back to the appeal court, to Justice Leverson, on three grounds. That the legal advisers failed to advise her correctly on matters that went to the heart of her plea, um, but because the elements of the offence were not made out and the appellant could not have been convicted, the result of the appellant's plea was equivocal, all of which is very legal and jargonistic. But what reading between the lines seems to be going on, and which has been going on in a number of these cases, is that we have very young, probably very vulnerable people who are themselves being put in the dock as um, perpetrators. And they're not really clear what's going on. And I'm not sure a lot of the time that their lawyers have got much of a clue what's going on. So they're not very well advised. Um, however, however, Law Leverson said, no, it stands. And there's a two paragraph bit in the appeal. The sexual nature of the acts is of any common sense view different where the complainant is deliberately deceived by a defendant into believing that the latter is a male. Presumably he means when they're actually female, not obviously when the person is male. Um, that's Lord Leverson. When judges start referring to common sense, I start counting spoons because that sounds a lot like he's making the law up. Um, he then goes on, it follows from the foregoing analysis that we conclude that depending upon the circumstances, deception as to gender can vitiate consent. Now, it's interesting because deception happens all the time. We know it happens all the time. Marital status, job, job prospects, religion, all, all manner of things. Size of breasts. Yes, yeah, size of penis. Size of breasts, size of penis. Yeah, what I had to do there. Yes, yes, yeah. probably that as well. Um, so let's throw Yes, a sidetrack which has been going on over the last few years is the police spies case. In fact, we could have had the whole of this evening about that. Police spies case involved undercover policemen who fibbed about who and what they were, who had relationships with mostly young female activists. And interestingly, this has not been held in the end to be um, a sex by deception case, but is it an abuse of human rights? And what I found very interesting was a comment from Nick Creedon, Dodge Chief Constable, who was tasked with investigating what went on. And Nick Creedon said, around the country, this is a police chief, there are many people involved in sexual relationships who lie about their status. There are many people who say they're not married or they're married. It happens. Ask the police what you want. Deception. Deception is mostly okay. Just this one thing about gender. Um, Let's add some very quick perspectives. 
there are similarities between most of these defendants. They are young, they are very often not very sure of what their own status is. Some would identify as lesbians, some would identify as trans men. Some shift and change, which is why I've been fairly careful, or, or rather I've let the court version of the name stand, because it's not always clear where people identify on the spectrum, and at least one of those involved changed what they claimed as their status through the trial. Um, there's definitely a social thing about gender. In other words, if you look at the Matrimonial Causes Act, being transgender is about the only cited cause, there are a couple of other causes, the only cited cause for getting a allotment. And there are specific exemptions around the trans issue in equal marriage. So again, some however our lawmakers think that being transgender matters to people in a way that lying about your other statuses doesn't matter. Um, there's very little clarity about the effect of a gender recognition certificate, which supposedly means that for all legal purposes you are the gender that it says on the gender recognition certificate. My own suspicion, given what Lord Leaderson said, is he would have expected someone, even with a gender recognition certificate, to own up to their pre-GRC history. Um, and the whole issue doesn't seem to affect trans women so much because mostly the penalty, if I deceive, if a guy takes me back to his place and um, then later discovers that I'm a trans woman, it's more likely I'll be beaten up than taken to court. Um, right. The issues, very, very quickly before passing on to Stephen and Julian. Um, at the time of the McNally and Barker cases, there had been a presumption that the Sex Offences Act 2003 had done away of sex by deception, because previously this came up under the 56 uh, Sexual Offences Act. Um, there is a case, uh, Jennifer Saunders, not mm -hmm. that one, also known as Jimmy Saunders from the 1990s, in which the tabloid language and the judge's language were very much the same. That was under previous legal dispensation. What I can say is that I have spoken with the prosecuting authorities, and Stephen, you were involved in that as well, and they were surprised that Leaderson had come up to the conclusion he came to. They genuinely thought that in 2003 we had done away with sex by deception. Having said that, um, I personally, I've said I played devil's advocate, but I have a concern about these cases in that there is clearly trauma. And I think that it's too easy and too facile to say we can just do away with any sex by deception cases and conditional consent. There are people here who are victims or who have suffered trauma as a result of their experiences. And we have to find the right balancing spot in the law for those people. Um, where I would probably come down is not to say Leaderson does, but there's some common sense presumption about gender, because this is what Leaderson is doing, to say, common sense, gender matters, something else doesn't. Um, were there a slightly larger audience, I would have said to people, if somebody fibbed, which would you rather, that somebody fibbed to you about the fact they were a paedophile, or fibbed to you about their birth gender? I don't know. The point is that fibbing, or not being straightforward about birth gender, leads to prison. Not being straightforward about being a paedophile leads to no problem at all. And that is where our law has taken us. Um, in my own view, uh, I have come across this once before. It was conditional consent. It was prior to having a relationship with somebody. My background is Catholic in Poland and this person's background was Jewish in Poland. And they wanted to know about my take on issues in Poland during the war, because it's quite possible that, probably not by my family, but by people my family knew, had been involved in putting members of her family into concentration camps. She wanted to know. And I think if she, had, as she did say, you know, said before a relationship starts, I want to know about this, I think that's a very fair question to ask. And I think we're right to lie on a direct question 
then I do think it validates consent. But that's very different from what Leibson is saying, which is it's common sense which genders the issue. So I'm going to finish now for having you with Stephen. It feels to me like there is room in law for... It feels to me like there is room in law for unconditional consent, but not on the basis we have it now. Um, and that what we do have right now is something that reinforces very traditional patriarchal values in which the sort of fibs and lies that men tell are common sense and the sort of thing that nobody in their right mind would get upset about, whereas one particular group or two particular groups, lesbian women and trans men, seem to be absolutely in the crosshairs of police and courts. Thank you. Stephen. Okay, I'm going to suggest we swap seats. So I can yes. be still seen on that thing while I'm talking rather than being hidden behind the screen. Okay, um, I'm Stephen Whittle. I'm Professor of Equality as well at Manchester Metropolitan University. I'm also a trans man who transitioned 41 years ago now, inside 1975, what do you have? <laughs> um, which means that when I was seeking treatment, there weren't really anywhere models about, models or discussions around transsexualism, except with regard to a few transsexual women, notably April Ashley, who became the person who in Corbett and Corbett sought a divorce, partner sourced an annulment of a marriage, and ultimately on what made certain decisions, which were to mean that trans people were left high and dry for 25 years, is it? Well, 35 years. Um, so, and this whole question to me is not about, you know, the legality, the legal niceties, but it's very much about people I know. I ran for 25 years the network for female to male transsexual people here in the UK. I had over 3,000 members through that network. And that's therefore 3,000 people who could have potentially, at the early stages of their life, find themselves to be any one of these individuals who face the court. And certainly, my wife, who I've now been in a relationship for 38 years, she was still a schoolgirl when she met the long-haired student on a motorbike who fell badly in love with her and took her to bed six weeks later. However, with full knowledge, full disclosure, uh, said, you know, I'm happy to go to bed with you, but I'm keeping my clothes off <laughs> for the time being. Um, didn't last very long. But with that full disclosure. Now, having been through that, having spent years working with trans men, and through the process of transitioning, enabling them to move forward in their lives. Um, I've worked out sort of various bits of advice I give to people when they say, I found a new girlfriend, I really like her, when should I tell her? And so I will simply whisper into my ear as soon as possible for various reasons. And that is the longer you leave somebody not knowing about your background, the more they feel angry that they've been somehow, um, what's the word, oh, you know, um, deceived. Not about that, before you go to even bed to bed with them, before you even get to that point where you're actually having an emotional relationship, you're building a girlfriend-boyfriend relationship, her view, and my view increasingly, uh, has been, you know, you tell the person as soon as possible, I have never known a woman who is not willing to have a relationship with a transsexual now just because he's transsexual. That's never been the issue. Um, you know, most women, it doesn't matter the damn, but in fact, you know, as somebody once said, it's far better if it's not an okay guy, because at least he won't think his dick's the be all and end all of sex. <laughs> Practical matter. Obviously, we've had this series of cases, and I think it's probably worthwhile going back to the very first of these that we know of here in the UK, and that was the Jimmy Jennifer Saunders case. Uh, it was prosecuted in 1991. Um, Jimmy Saunders, or Jennifer, was given, at the time, six years. 
for indecent assault on the girl that um, he had not disclosed the fact that he wanted to have gender reassignment to. Now, I don't know whether Jennifer Jimmy Saunders ever went on to have gender reassignment, ultimately, um, but at the time, they were quite clear that they wanted to have gender reassignment. The girlfriend, interestingly, was very averse to the prosecution. It was the girlfriend's parents who had worked out that Jimmy was not born male and had insisted upon a prosecution. However, despite the fact that the girlfriend was very averse to the prosecution at the time, um, Judge Crabtree at the time said he suspected the victim would rather have been raped by some young man you have called into question her whole sexual identity. In other words, having sex with her and not telling her that you were actually born female is, um, you know, a complete anathema. That Joe Saunders' case, uh, sentence of six years, was reduced on appeal to nine months, which seems to be the sort of positioning we're at at the moment, where an appeal is made on sentencing, it's reduced the time served about nine months. Chris Wilson, who um, uh, Jane has referred to, was prosecuted in Scotland. He was prosecuted on two counts of obtaining sexual intimacy by fraud, which is a completely made up offence. It doesn't exist under Scottish law at all, and yet, um, he was managed, he pleaded, pled guilty, and he was given a two year suspended sentence for it. Now, Chris was probably the person who, clearer than anyone, said, I'm Chris, not the previous person, I'm Chris, and I want gender reassignment. I'm waiting for my appointment with the doctor. And that was at the point that they were, actually had the referral through to the clinic in Edinburgh. And he consequently, as I said, got a two year suspended sentence. What, however, we've seen is these series of other cases, and you know, there's another one, um, Lindsay Sandbrook's, that's a recent case of similar, you know, sex by deception case, brought us to the nature and purpose of the sexual act. There's a huge question that lies around that question. What is the fraud as to the nature and purpose of a sexual act? When we think about what sexual acts were like, this is not the discussion that's ever been had in court in these cases. When we think about the nature and purpose of a sexual act between two people, what's a person's motivations behind it, and what are they trying to achieve? Now, in all of these individuals' cases, they were not the person being touched. They were touching the other person in order to give them, presumably, sexual pleasure, in order to make them more confirmed in their relationship with them. Well, that seems to have been missed completely. It's almost like when you did this deliberately, you deceived them deliberately in order to sexually penetrate them, not as in, you know, rape where the guy might, you know, actually ejaculate. We're not talking about anything like that. We're talking about giving the other person, the party who's technically the complainant, the pleasure. So, you know, there is that question that I think lies at the back of this is, you know, we've never had a proper discussion about, in the courts, about what is taking place in the bedroom between those two people. But, it, you know, that Crabtree's view that this is worse than being raped by a boy seems to perpetrate right the way through these. Um, and it's only, as, I said, as Jane said in the McGarry case, that we finally get a discussion of any sort because there is an appeal against the conviction. Um, I lost her, I think. I knew that would happen. Damn. Um, okay, but so what we've got in the McGarry case is this appeal. And left them with this long discussion about common sense. And therefore, is he implying this is a question for the jury to impact? If we threw this open to the jury, what would the jury think was common sense about sexual activity? There is no discussion ever in the cases about the fact that in at least three of them, the complainants were the parents of the young 
prefer to work with the rod, not the girl themselves. We've had at least two cases where girls have actually stood in court and said they don't want this prosecution to take place and they don't feel that they were abused. So the prosecution has gone ahead. And we've had, you know, as I say, a case where we've got somebody charged with something that's non existent. And then we have this whole idea of Levison's that, in fact, um, we should be having um, some general uh, view of what common sense is now. Got the bit that really matters that I want. There we are. Right. So, thinking about these, and I've thought about them a hell of a lot. <laughs> okay. What is it that the courts are doing here? What is it they expect trans people to do? Is Leveson implying by this notion of common sense, in which there are some circumstances in which perhaps it may not be a sexual the things that trans men can do to vitiate the deception as such. So what is that that he's expecting? You know, one of the things we've discussed as, should all trans people disclose as a matter of course, at any point in their life, regardless of what it is, status they're in, how long they've been transitioned, what surgeries they've had, should it always be obligatory for them to disclose? Or on the other hand, should we make certain that when people state quite clearly that they want gender reassignment or in the process of getting it or in the process of having it, that they should never be prosecuted under those circumstances? Now, at what point do we say where this is a genuine case of obtaining sex by deception because the person is transgender, or a genuine case of abuse of obtaining sex by deception. And that, I think, is a fine point. You know? um, Leveson says at one point about, in the McNally case, that uh, the victim chose to have sexual encounters with a boy, and her preference, her freedom to choose whether or not to have a sexual encounter with a girl, was removed by the defendant's deception. But what we have in this circumstance is a Two people, um, you know, we have the whole question of what is the definition of a boy? You know, what do we mean by a boy? How do we decide when somebody's a boy? We thought we had that in 1971 with the April Ashley case, when Omar stated that April Ashley's new vagina was not a vagina for the purposes of marriage in terms of sexual intercourse, nor was it a vagina in terms of consummation of a marriage, because it was only centimetres from the anal passage. Well, most of the guys seem to be centimetres from the anal passage. You know. But that was seriously the statement that he made and upon which decisions would be made. Alternatively, we, we say there's a point where trans men have to disclose and up and beyond that point they don't have to any longer. What is that point? You know, do we say, well, it's when somebody permanently transitions in work and at home to living as a boy? Do we say it's when they start medical treatment? Do we say it's when they have a, finally obtained a gender recognition certificate, which in my case would have meant I'd have had no sex for 26 years? I think it would have been a really miserable existence. <laughs> um, do we insist it's when they have genital surgery? And in fact, genital surgery is still not an option for most trans men, A, because the operations are expensive, complicated, and we only have two teams in this country doing it with six year long waiting lists. You know, so it's not easy to go off and get a willy made, and even if you do get onto the queuing point, you know, you can often be 10, 10 to 13 operations down the line before you've completed surgery. And I, it's, um, potentially very problematic surgery in itself. It can cause, you know, effectively serious injury. So, you know, those are the sorts of two extremes, you know, full disclosure, no disclosure, or some point in time. You know, if we were looking at some point in time, we'd have to start creating a legal test for when a person stops being female and becomes male. Is it when they can grow a beard? Is it when their voice has broken? Is it when they can't, you know, their breasts have been removed? What do we do at that point? And 
so I gave you this sort of, I could go on forever and ever and ever about these cases, but at what point do trans men have to disclose to their sexual partners, prospective sexual partners? There is a difference between somebody you might want to sleep with for the rest of your life and somebody who whom you're having a fling. Yeah? Do you always have to tell? Are you allowed some point of privacy? Where do the Article 8 rights of the trans men exist? And I, one of the things I would say in all this in this discussion, this is we always have to remember that there is the party, the victim, technically. You know, we have to respect their rights to privacy, also their rights to, you know, ensure that they're doing something they want. But the idea that sex by deception, by me saying to somebody, well, I'm a millionaire, you know, and I've got a yacht out in the harbour, and me saying, well, actually, I was born female. <laughs> Which of those two is the more serious deception? And it seems, or it seems to me, as the person who was trans, the most serious deception would be telling them that I had a yacht in the harbour, you know, and had millions of pounds, because I really couldn't fulfil those promises. Well, so actually, you never know. Go to bed with me, you might find I was quite a good mother. Yeah, which is the answer to it all. Kind and cons kind and considerate. <laughs> but that's where the lines sit. There are lots of discussions that are going on around this point. What really concerns me is that we had the Jimmy Saunders case in 1991. We've had nothing since for years, and then suddenly. As trans people have become visible, as social networking, particularly lots of these relationships were built upon Facebook, there seems to be a general assumption that somehow the trans person or the person who identifies in that way is at fault. And it's, it's really interesting if you start to read the evidence in some of the cases, for example the Gail Newland case, at one point the other party, the victim, admits that they regularly watched films together. And then on the other breath, Brett says, I never saw the, the person, defendant's face because they always said they wanted me blindfolded. And we're going, how can you watch films blindfolded? And if you took off your blindfold, would you have a sneaky look at who the other person was? In other words, nobody actually listened to the evidence properly because it involves a trans man. And that's the real crux. Trans man's voice, even the girl's voice, when she says she doesn't want the prosecution, they are not listened to. There is a general assumption, as Leveson believed, that somehow it's common sense and we all know what the answer really is. And my argument is, I don't think we do. I really don't think Lord Leveson has the faintest idea about the relationships that trans men have. Um, yes, that did remind me of one other point coming into it. I mean, it does, the law stipulates things like penetration or non penetration and so on, but the language of the appeal was very much around sex acts. And what was very revealing to myself was that at least one of these cases revolved around intimacy. In other words, if you are intimate with somebody and you don't reveal something about your background, then you've committed an offence. Seems yes, quite it's all about, about penetration. Well, it is, exactly, and, and, it, and it did, and, and there's a certain dark humour in some trans circles which led to people questioning how dangerous a trans thing it was. Because if you look at the details of the McNally case, there were six charges accepted, um, but no one pled guilty to six charges of penetration with a finger, and there was one left to lie on the file which was penetration with an object. So, presumably, they felt they'd got their prosecution. And they weren't going to go any further. And um, as, a, as, a, as a very philosophical level, in what way a trans finger is different from a non trans finger, it just makes my head hurt. I don't know. Julian, I'm going to leave you to um, announce yourself and explain yourself and throw it open to debate. Yeah, my name is Julian Norman. Um, I do have a small criminal practice, but I'm by no means an expert. Crime. My main area is immigration. Um, I'm also a trustee of Feminism in London. So that's the perspective I've got, which means that if I get the law wrong, those who are criminal experts in the audience, whom I can see at least one, uh, please do correct me. 
Uh, I was going to look very briefly at the history of sex by deception and a few bits of uh, what I think is interesting case law uh, before turning to a short analysis. And the current law um, on sexual offences, as the others have said, is the Sexual Offences Act of 2003. Prior to this, the main bit of legislation was the Sexual Offences Act of 1956. Section 3.1 of that made, and I love this wording, procurement of a woman by false pretenses was a criminal offence. And uh, the text of that is, it is an offence for a person to procure a woman by false pretenses or false representations to have sexual intercourse in any part of the world. And that's kind of interesting because of the language there, procurement, obtaining. The 1956 Act very much understood sex as something that was procured by a man and given willingly or unwillingly by a woman. Uh, and obviously that reflects the social mores of the time. And looking at that 1956 Act, that's relevant to this discussion because it attempted to draw a distinction between consent to an act and the terms upon which it was done. So one case uh, from that that I have dug out, uh, Crown and Lineker of 1994, uh, and that was a finding that the only type of fraud which vitiated consent were frauds as to the nature of the act itself or the identity of the person who did it, and that's been brought into the 2003 Act. Now if we look at the facts in Lineker, this was not a trans case, this was a case of it says here, alleged rape, I would say it was rape. Um, the complainant was a woman of 30 who worked occasionally as a prostitute. Uh, the appellant, that is the defendant, the person who, had, uh, who was convicted, although it was subsequently overturned, uh, negotiated a fee of £25 for sexual intercourse. They had sex. He then made off without payment. Um, the Crown's case, based on her evidence, was that she would never have agreed to sex unless she was paid in advance and a condom was used, and the appellant defendant had done neither. Now, we would now understand that uh, as potentially, if those facts were accepted, we would now understand that as rape. And that was uh, held in the Assange judgment. If somebody says, well, I will only have sex with a condom, and you then have sex without a condom, that could on that threshold be rape. Um, the jury were directed that if the intercourse was obtained by fraud, the complainant could not be said to have consented to it, and they uh, convicted him. On appeal, the uh, Court of Appeal was of the view that the only type of fraud which could vitiate consent in an act of rape were frauds as to the nature of the act itself or the identity of the person doing it. In other words, what had happened here was that she had consented to sex, that is, penetration uh, of the vagina by a penis, and the terms were a completely different kettle of fish. And it's that artificial distinction that was drawn, which meant that he was, of course, acquitted on appeal. They said it was the absence of consent and not the existence of fraud which made it rape. And that goes back to an 1888 case uh, of Clarence, Consent obtained by fraud is no consent at all, is not true as a general proposition, either in fact or in law. Um, and Mr Justice Stevens there, the only sorts of fraud which so far destroy the effect of a woman's consent uh, as to convert a connection consented to, in fact, into a rape, are frauds as to the nature of the act itself or as to the identity of the person who does the act. Um, Consent in such cases does not exist at all because the act consented to is not the act done. So that was the principle that was then later applied to in 1994. And that obviously leads to complications because you have somebody who is saying, well, no, I would absolutely not have consented had I been aware of these particular things, i.e. that you weren't going to pay me or that you weren't going to use a condom. Um, Whereas the law at that time was very much of the view that if you've consented, you've consented, uh, and the rest is fraud if it is anything at all. Um, and of course, we now have the Sexual Offences Act of 2003. The relevant sections are 74 to 76. 
And 74 is particularly interesting here. Uh, for the purposes of this part, a person consents if he agrees by choice and has the freedom and capacity to make that choice. Uh, section 75 is evidential presumptions about consent. This is 2003, and we had to put into law that if somebody is unconscious, there is a rebuttable presumption that they can't consent. Uh, and then 76, conclusive presumptions about consent. And you might ask if something is a presumption, how it can be conclusive, but there it is. Uh, and that is bringing back in the nature or purpose of the act or whether the defendant intentionally induced the consent by impersonating a person known personally to the complainant, which does, of course, lead to the possible question as to whether, if you are impersonating a person who is not known personally because they are a complete fiction of your imagination, is consent still vitiated? Um, other jurisdictions also have this. Um, procurement by false pretenses uh, exists in Hong Kong law, as you might imagine. Although a very oddly drafted uh, law, a person who procures another person by false pretenses or false representations to do an unlawful sexual act in Hong Kong or elsewhere shall be guilty of an offence. Um, this has been used uh, where a young aspiring model was having no luck with her career and approached a self-proclaimed Taoist master to see if he could help. He persuaded her to engage in rituals which just happened to involve him having lots of sex with her uh, and happened multiple times before she apparently started wondering if she'd been duped. Uh, she had. Um, he was convicted. I understand that there was an appeal. It's unclear. I couldn't find it on the net whether or not uh, the appeal was uh, successful or not. Um, so where does this leave us? Well, you've got the nature of the type, which has existed for well over a century. Um, so if you deceive as to the nature of the act, you're going to have vaginal sex, and it turns out to be anal sex, for example. Or if you impersonate somebody's husband, uh, that's uh, the identity issue. So there have been cases where somebody has... Uh, found themselves having sex with someone they thought was their husband, it turns out it's their brother-in-law, that, that vitiates consent to the extent that it's rape. And then you've got the freedom to consent. Is your choice being removed? And there we have a particularly interesting tension between the CPS guidance, um, which I've printed out, uh, as contrasted with their decision. Uh, the charging decision on the police officer's case that Jane alluded to earlier. Um, so, uh, for example, we've got the conclusive presumption section here. Um, there have been cases, um, Tabassum, 2002, where the defendant conducted breast examinations for his own sexual gratification. No genuine consent because the complainants had only consented to acts of a medical nature. Um, and Devonald, the conviction of co causing a person to engage in sexual activity where the defendant had posed as a young woman and persuaded him to masturbate in front of a webcam. Um, they then go on to look at uh, different deceptions and, and what would or would not be enough to vitiate consent. But then you look at their charging decision in the police officer's case and they say that um, the law does not go further and allow the fact that a person does not reveal their true or full identity to be capable of vitiating consent where it is otherwise freely given. Now, I don't see how that charging decision can possibly coexist with the uh, decisions of their lordships in McNally, where it was failure to disclose the true or full identity uh, where consent is otherwise freely given. So I'm sure that that will uh, continue as a debate um, going forwards. Of course, one difficulty is that any law is going to be interpreted through the lens of what judges call common sense uh, and which other people may well call prejudice or privilege or uh, something like that. For example, self-evidently, I'm not going to agree that having sex with a person of your own sex or gender is inherently terrifying. But there are people 
I don't like to speculate as to whether they might include their lordships in the Court of Appeal. Who would think that that's inherently terrifying and would vitiate consent? Um, I don't know if anybody here has ever read the Shakespeare blog written by Melissa McEwen. She has this concept of a validity prism, uh, that everything is put through this validity prism of people's experiences and, what, and how they feel. And when you have something that's subjective, in what circumstances would consent be vitiated? You do have to look at who's going to be uh, considering it and what preconceptions they might have. So moving towards um, a very short analysis, my view is that I would be very, very cautious about reintroducing a law from the 1950s and codifying into our law that uh, conditional consent or sex by deception should be a specific separate offence. Uh, the reasons for that are firstly it clearly didn't work. Uh, the case that I cited earlier of Lineker um, basically protected the right of a man um, to have unwanted intercourse with a sex worker in terms that we might now understand as rape. And secondly, because of the fundamental shift that's happened over the last generation or two in how we understand sex, and it's still imperfect, but from the 1950s to our modern understanding of protecting consent. Um, in the 50s, we still had a very blackstone view of sex as something that a man seeks, a woman provides, and there might be conditions or contract terms. Um, you know, is this an implied contract term that Gender is, uh, is going to be central. Um, is there an explicit contract term that, you know, I will not have sex with you unless you wear a condom? Well, I don't think that contract terms have any place in the bedroom, except if you're particularly into that type of thing, which is a different debate. Um, but that type of contractual, transactional view of sex, I think is something we have done well to step away from, and we should be stepping away from. Um, Thirdly, how could you possibly draft it? If you are seeking a drafted law that A is a sex offender, if A does not disclose all possible things that a sexual partner might want to know, um, that gives you a very broad rush and criminalises most of Match.com. Uh, there's a whole spectrum of things, but back to the dreaded common sense that some people would want to know, or most people would want to know. So you could say, am I having sex with a man or a woman? This might not be important to some people, but I think it's probably important to a lot. Um, am I having sex with somebody who has um, STIs? Is important to a lot of people. Is he married? Um, is he really a senior accountant, or is he the chap who's been fixing photocopiers? How about, darling, I will love you forever. <laughs> At what point does a false representation, uh, without which you would not have sex, constitute sex by deception that should be any of the business of the state? Uh, Stephen touched on the yacht in the harbour um, and says, you know, if I say I have a yacht in the harbour, that might be uh, more serious um, than disclosing gender. But, you know, some people really are that shallow. Uh, do we want to enshrine people's rights to be thoroughly shallow into our criminal law? Do we really want to criminalise adultery? Because that's what we're looking at. At present, the law is that consent must be freely given. That's section 74. A person consents if he agrees by choice and has the freedom and capacity to make that choice. Um, if you tell your sexual partner, therefore, that you will only have sex with a condom, with a man, with whatever condition, and they then deliberately deceive you, then that choice has been removed from you, and that already constitutes assault within our law. Now, whether or not it could be successfully prosecuted is a completely separate problem, um, because we're then back to the perennial problem of all um, sexual assault cases, which tend to be one person's word against another's. You know, I told him I'd only have sex if he agreed to leave his wife, I told her no such thing. You're going to be back, back down to that, who does the jury believe? 
Um, and also whether or not that, that charging decision is going to be made by the CPS. Uh, and with social con convention clouding thinking. So the people, um, all of them by complete coincidence, men who decided the McNally case, added in uh, a little Oberta remark, um, which I will actually find because it's illuminating. And of course now I can't find. Um, but where they said that one of the things that would not uh, count would be deceptions to wealth. And it's very unclear why. Um, that, that's in the uh, McNally case. They determined that deceptions to gender can vitiate consent. And then added in, in reality, some deceptions such as, for example, in relation to wealth, will obviously not be sufficient to vitiate consent. Well, why not? People have different sexual boundaries, and if somebody's boundary is, well, I, I only have sex with people with a certain income, or conversely, I only have sex with people who are not members of the 1%, um, why should that be taken any less seriously or treated any differently to somebody who says, well, I will only have sex with somebody who um, it's a born a boy. Yeah. Because that's what it boils down to. It's not not a boy, but it's born a boy. Yeah, absolutely. Um, now there are, of course, a, a whole group of people for whom lying about their income is practically foreplay. So we can understand why it is that you would that they would say that. Yeah, you know, this is so widespread as to be uh, something which obviously couldn't vitiate consent. But I think, I think we'd need to look, if there was going to be a proposition to incorporate this into criminal law, as to why that might be, and why some conditions would be treated as set in stone and some could be dispensed with. Um, so as far as I'm concerned, much of this belongs outside the criminal law. We're looking at the line here uh, between caddishness and criminality. I'm just going to finish by reading um, something which I thought was really interesting. This is from the online sexual offences handbook. Um, if A wishes to engage in sexual activity with B, the law expects A to allow B enough information about A in the encounter to make their own free choice about whether or not to consent. Whether that is analysed in terms of B's sexual agency or autonomy, the central importance of B's freedom to choose is fundamental to the scheme of the Sexual Offences Act of 2003. The Sexual Offences Act 2003 was drafted to change consent from something sought by a stronger male and given by a weaker female into something freely given by two persons, whatever their, their gender, agreement between equal. Now, I have no idea who wrote that, but I think that that is a really important thing and that uh, we should try to avoid reinstating what are effectively either implied or explicit contract terms into sex. Uh, right, well, I'm just going to pull people in uh, again for um, an observation, which is... It, feels like maybe you're saying, actually I'm not 100% sure where you're going with that because you're saying that consent is at the heart of it. Um, I write a lot about different sexualities including BDSM and uh, swinging and I have very interesting and different experiences, both of which take a view that their take on sexuality is probably superior to that of people who don't do BDSM or swinging because they actually talk about what is going to happen. In the BDSM case, um, whatever happens, there are boundaries, there is consent, there is negotiation. If you think about non-BDSM sexual acts, very rarely is there any explicit negotiation as to what is going to happen. Um, swinging, on the other hand, seems to be more if you're there, you're up for it. But And if you're not up for it, then you move yourself from the place. So there are lots of different models of consent. Um, Throwing it open, this is about sex by deception and whether that, as a concept, is helpful or not. Um, 
and I guess for a lot of people feel that they think that should be in law. And yes, it has focused very heavily on a very specific um, concept, um, that of gender. But the other question is whether it should focus on anywhere else. Should it be in law at all? Or if it should be in law, what should it focus on? Yeah. Um, can I just sort of mention one sort of point of uh, information or clarification about McNally and, and then perhaps ask the panel a question? Because um, I think the point that's been missing in McNally it wasn't really about the common sense um, point that uh, Let's have made. The decision was actually that gender or deception, in inverted commas, as to gender, can in some circumstances vitiate consent. It didn't say it always did. And I think that's important, and I think that's in advising people who are concerned about it, it's, it's important to know that it can sometimes. Because the problem with McNally was it was an appeal against a guilty plea. So you've yes. got to then argue that there is no way that McNally could have pleaded guilty because there was no offence. So the decision only to uphold the conviction simply had to be, well, she could have done, and, and she did, and therefore we're, we're not watching it. The problem, obviously, then is, well, when does it vitiate consent, and when doesn't it? Uh, and the, there is no real answer. Um, gender recognition certificate, there is some clarification. So I think the Law Commission said that there shouldn't be a prosecution uh, where there has been a, where someone's obtained a gender recognition certificate. And I think given, as you've said, uh, that for all intents and purposes, under the law, that person is then treated as uh, a uh, gender. That uh, means any prosecution would be unlikely to succeed. I think the key is going to be, in an appropriate case, uh, Article 8 uh, of the Convention, right to and private life. Um, because the distinction, I think, as you say, as to who can, where there is a deception, whether isn't, isn't based on the time or the, the state or the stage along whichever road this person is travelling that they've reached. I think it's, it's based on the distinction between someone who is genuinely trans and is on that road and someone who is disguising themselves for malicious purposes. And we mentioned Devonport, and I think that's an example of that other extreme, because the reason the chap posed as a woman uh, and persuaded the young man to masturbate over a webcam was not due to any gender identity issues, it was because the young man had uh, gone out with his daughter and treated her quite badly. Revenge, yes. And uh, so he set this up in order to humiliate him. And that's, on one view, a deception as to gender which could be said to officiate consent, although it's a fairly odd example. Um, but I think that's going to be the key, is, is looking at articulate and abuse of process uh, type arguments in, in the right case, that's what we need to see clarification, other than other than get it changed by legislation is the other option. The question I was going to ask the, the panel was, um, given the title of, of the lecture was, uh, uh, or the series of lectures is uh, that it's um, part of a feminist perspective, how do the rights of the you know, complainant, victim, whatever you want to call them, fit into the, the discussion that we've had? Because most of the complainants, I think all of the complainants in the cases you mentioned were Female. Yes. Um, some of the movement that there's been, as we've just said, in the Sexual Offences Act 03 and the cases since, have been intended to uh, widen the definition of consent, to properly recognise the importance of consent and to empower uh, people, particularly women in, in those circumstances, to be able to set boundaries. Um, and so I think there is a, a tension or arguably this tension, I'm playing devil's advocate rather than my own personal view on it, um, as to how those two competing considerations come together. I mean, obviously the, the defendant is the only one who faces prison as a result of any <coughs> criminal case, and so obviously that's going to weigh strongly uh, in their favour. Yeah. But I was interested to see what the panel's view is, looking at it from a victim's feminist perspective. I think there's, um, just to pick up on the first, um, the other issue that you raised, which was over article 8, the CPS legal guidance says that it's very important to use the right pronoun uh, under their whole article 8 uh, analysis, which is that. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, which I think is quite nice. But yes, you, you've got a, a very clear article 8 um, 
argument there. And it will be really interesting to see what happens with that. From the complainant's perspective, uh, and I think it is interesting to look at whether or not the complainants in such cases, and not just with, uh, with trans cases, but also with, um, with some of the other cases, look at whether or not the uh, complainants support the prosecution, because it's all very well enshrining autonomy in law. If you, if you then take a very paternalistic Absolutely. approach to it and say, well, that girl doesn't know her own mind, you know, she must have. Um, she couldn't have properly consented because I don't think she should have done. Uh, that would be quite a dangerous approach. Um, but moving beyond that, I think that part of the tension is um, that girls and women are discouraged from giving enthusiastic consent to sex. Sex remains something that is very much for, for boys to chase and girls to give up. Girls remain gatekeepers of sex there. So we're teaching boys, and you look at sort of just general media, films, books, all sorts of things, we're teaching boys that no sometimes means yes but keep chasing. And we're teaching girls that if they say yes, then um, they're being slapped. They're slaps. Um, which is obviously a setup for an absolute mess. So if you then look at uh, what we're expecting within the law, what we're expecting is that women say initially, and I'm, I'm using women here to mean complainants because the majority are, are women, um, we're expecting people to set their own sexual boundaries explicitly in a way that will stand up in court against a backdrop of not being encouraged to talk openly about sex. So if you've got a so then the problem is that if so much of sexual negotiation is implicit rather than explicit, um, you're back to your implied contract terms and that's a disaster. What we need is for women to feel, um, I don't like the word, but empowered, because it gets overused so badly and misused so badly, but we do need women to feel that they have the uh, ability uh, to give enthusiastic consent and to define their boundaries clearly, because it's only then that they are clear enough that if somebody oversteps them, it's not a mistake, but an offence. Absolutely. I, I mean, and that's... As a father of three daughters, and having several nieces as well, I've seen the niece who got pregnant when the age of 15 because she didn't know how to say no when she liked the boy. So she knew how to say no if she didn't like him, but she didn't know how to say no when she didn't like him. I just recently had an incident of my own daughter who um, fell head over heels with the first boy who made a play at her at the age of 18. She never considered herself somebody interested in boys particularly. She always thought she was not very pretty. Seems really sad because <laughs> she is incredibly beautiful, but she's got a, she's a twin, so she has a twin sister who she was always comparing herself against. She got herself a boyfriend on her first gap year in Australia, and then discovered that as well as sleeping with her, he was sleeping with somebody else. And her, she was rightfully very upset and angry. But at one point, I talked to her about the fact that did she want to pursue this matter and make a complaint? because she had only agreed to go to bed with him on the basis that he was going to bed with her and her only. You know, and she said, well, no, of course I wouldn't make a complaint. No, of course I wouldn't. I agreed to the sex. I know, but you agreed to the sex under certain circumstances. Because if these cases carry, now, you know, it wouldn't happen here in the UK, but there is potential, technically, in Australian law for her to have raised a complaint against him because he had set up a series of, he'd set up a, a, an expectation of what was the basis upon which they would have a sexual relationship. Now, I actually don't know if that's necessarily the right way to go, but it was a potential of explaining to her she ha could bring a complaint. But it's about, I mean, first of all, I absolutely believe we don't properly do proper sex education for, for girls or boys. <laughs> absolutely don't. My son persists in telling me that I'm the best father ever because I explained to him fully how girls' bits worked before he ever had sex with a girl. And he now holds classes for his university college mates on, you know, before they have sexual relationships with a girl. This is how it all works. Because they never knew. He, his friends have not ever known. 
properly what the relationship of the clitoris was with the vagina. They knew it was there, but they didn't know how it worked. So we see this constant repetition. Now what we're asking in the cases, in these cases, is we have young people who the assumption is somehow if, if they're over 18 that they're mature, but you know, I know lots of very immature people over the age of 18, and then immature people over the age of 30. So you still see them, but that they're mature and that they're able to fully voice their issues and concerns. As I say, in some of these, I don't think that's the case. Secondly, in some of these cases, as is clear from the cases, from the follow-ups follow I've done afterwards, is that the girls knew that their partner was not male, but had not disclosed that to their friends or their parents. And when the parents found out, the girl has fallen back onto the I'm not a lesbian defence by denouncing the boyfriend. Now, sometimes girls have the ability to stand up to the sort of pressure that they get from their families. My, my, my own life was a case in hand of how can you possibly think you're going to live with somebody who's had a sex change? Well, tough mum and dad, I am going to. Yeah? And you can do what you like, but I'm moving in at the weekend. But that was 40 years ago. She managed to stand up and say <coughs> what she wanted. But many girls the models we give them through magazines, through the media, through television dramas, etc. This whole idea that they're chased in every simple sense of the word. You are chased until you're chased until you give up. You know, so you don't give voluntarily. The idea that you should say, I want it too. And what's also very clear is that when young people have sex, invariably in most cases, when they certainly past 18, they both want it. But that's not a debate that's had in the court because one of them's happened not to formally disclose. I mean, um, again, that whole question of disclosure, the, the arguments that the trans community have is, what does it say about my Article 8 rights to autonomy? My Article 8 rights to privacy and autonomy if I then have to disclose if I want to have sex with somebody. And I say, you know, that the counter-argument to that is, well, you know, and what does it say about the other person if they're not prepared to accept you fully as you are? But then the other feature that comes into all of these cases is the fact that the sexual activity has been primarily focused on giving pleasure to the person who's been the victim. So it's not been a cruel process. It's not been a process that's been intended to cause hurt and pain. It's been about giving pleasure that somebody wanted. Could I just butt in so, there yeah. and say that there, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean that something is not a sexual attack. One of the things that prevents uh, particularly boys and men who are abused by other men from coming forward is um, if, for example, they've had an erection while yes, being abused. Yes. No, so the fact, that somebody, that, so. the fact that somebody enjoys it or thinks they enjoyed it or, or possibly did enjoy it doesn't necessarily mean that they were consenting and everything is, no, is hunky dory. No. But if, if there is a clear, uh, I mean, it's, it's that idea that somebody has a relationship with somebody with a good heart, almost. I, I, I mean, I, I mean where, I'm going to just come in and say a couple of things. I'm here partly to listen to Julian. Um, Not me. <laughs> <laughs> it's feminism. It's feminism. You, uh, Excuse me, I've, I've got a longer term standing in feminism than either of you as his friends. All right, <laughs> All right Stephen. Um, uh, I should be very careful when I say that. Uh, okay, joking, I'm winding you up, I'm winding you up. Pay no yes. attention. <laughs> oh dear. Um, the, so I, I fence it in the sense that what I'm seeing here is a problematic issue. And what Julian is telling me is that trying to resolve it within the framework of the law is very, very difficult and can have worse consequences than you set out with. Um, I see evolving models both of consent and gender. I mean, what part of what comes through this, I mean, you, you were quoting the Ashley case about it, the, 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 the vagina not being a proper vagina, um, and, and I wonder whether 
is going to be the same in 10 years' time because we're on the threshold of trans women being able to have transplants. Mm. That will be interesting. I, I mean, uterus transplants, not that sort of thing. Um, we are moving forward, and there will be in 10, 20 years a generation of trans people who have spent most of their, if not all their adult lives, in their identified gender. They may never have gone through a puberty that corresponds to their, uh, their, their chromosomal gender might have given them. Um, I think uh, it, it, it's very, very strange. You, you, you talk to non trans people, and they do very often see you as the original gender, just performing. It doesn't occur to me that you can actually start to forget what that other gender was. And it happens to myself who is a late transition. Imagine how it is for somebody who started to transition at age five. Or well, somebody buying. like me who transitioned at the age of 17. Well, exactly. And, exactly. you know, I can have no memory left at all of what it was like to be a girl. And I find very problematic that so much of the running and the thinking on this is being done by men of a certain class and a certain age. I mean, even references to the sex or the sex act, I think, presupposes a very male what sex is. Um, it's almost like I feel a chunk of this should be handed over to a sort of feminist commission and let them work on it for a bit rather than. Uh, I know that's not going to happen. Um, Wouldn't it just, be lovely though? Oh, we'll have some feminist law reviews it be fun. It be fun. <laughs> just, to, just to come back on the McNally case, I, I, I understood that exactly as, as you said, that it simply said that. Um, seat as to gender could vitiate consent. The issue, without going too far outside, was that we met with prosecuting authorities at the time, and they hadn't thought that. So Leveson did go beyond what they thought the law was saying, and possibly took the law back, or possibly invented new law. Um, and you also have but it's all very well looking at it as lawyers, but for somebody living it on a daily basis, um, it raises questions if you're trapped, when are you supposed to say? Because if you don't say at the right point, you can find yourself at the receiving end of a criminal case. And the community was in, still is to some degree in uproar over this. One of the things you raised in your question was in your pre question discussion was the Gender Recognition Act. And you're saying, well, you know, it's clear, you know, that it would be understood. The issue with the Gender Recognition Act is, however, it requires nobody to have undergone any medical process apart from the diagnosis and certainly no surgery. So, in terms of the two bodies that are taking part, there is no difference, technically. So, why should the Gender Recognition Act? Make the difference. That's the that's first the question. The point wasn't that it, that it should make the difference. That's not, you know, that shouldn't be the dividing line between them. But that was just to deal with the issue that you mentioned. It hadn't. It wasn't clear where it came in. There is some clarity on that. It's everything on the spectrum beyond well, the clarity. Clarity to me is false clarity, because if we <laughs> say, well, you know, gender recognition act is there and it's clearly a point in time where the prosecution couldn't take place. The question is, why is that? Why? I mean, as NHS, the NHS waiting lists are currently extremely long, average six hours, six years before somebody will get to any form of surgical, surgery under the National Health Service, which means most, for many trans people, they have been transitioned, living in their new gender role, even without hormone therapy, I can still get the gender recognition certificate way before they even see the doctor. So the gender recognition certificate, to me, is an entirely false point of clarity. Because you can't, you can't pin clarity on something that actually has no, diff, no real meaning in terms of... You know, what, one of the things that comes up in Leveson is, I, it, it, at one point as I'm reading through it, I get a sense of the whole idea of consistency in law. 
And following the Ashley case, one of the things that happened following the Ashley case was a series of criminal case convictions in which repeatedly the courts said, we are announcing this transsexual person as not being able to be pros prosecuted as a man as for prostitution, but must be done for solicitation, albeit that they were prostituting themselves as a woman. Various other cases that go along, because following the Corbett case, we have to have consistency in law. There's only there's a case in Australia from 1987 which raises the same issues, but where where's the consistency within this current set of prosecutions? Sorry, just the point about consistency. Um, just your point about the gender recognition certificate and the fact that how can someone say that when they haven't gone through the surgeries and things like that? It again, boils down to the gender essentialism which the courts seek to sort of yes. impose. Um, I think the difficulty is when you have a lack of consistency across gender itself, not only uh, trans or cis, but also, you know, the myriad of things between well, that and outside that of that. That was my last question yeah. almost. And so also, I to it. What about the person who comes forward and says, I have a non-binary gender identity? Exactly. Which even is chromosomally. increasing the voice we're hearing. Can I yeah. pop in on consistency just to say that I think... Possibly one of the things that they've struggled with on the consistency front is consistency of the person. Um, because what struck me about the people who have ended up in court is that they're not presenting as one person, whether that is one woman, one man, or one non-binary person. They are running dual identities. Or in some case, I think Gemma Barker was impersonating three different men. Absolutely. Um, and the suggestion that I, I understand from the Lord Leveson judgment and also from the CPS guidance is that if you are presenting yourself as one person um, and sort of being consistent in who you are, you are much less likely to be in trouble than if you are running two identities. And of course that would kind of um, feed into how we understand fraud. Um, you know, something that I've explained to people is that there's no such thing really as a legal name within English mm. law. Mm. You can call yourself what you like. And if I change my name to Mickey Mouse and set up my bank account and my rent payments and so on in that identity, then that's fine. However, if Julian Norman and Mickey Mouse are the same person doing two things with two bank accounts and two identities, I am likely to end up in trouble. So I think that that may well be a focal point of where these sort of high-profile cases have ended up is that the consistency is, is between multiple identities. I mean, can I, if I come in on that, I think part of it has to do with the quality of legal representation. Um, the book, which I started out by looking at uh, law on extreme porn, and I went back and looked at obscenity and looked at all sorts of other aspects of the law, how we, how we regulate particularly pornography, but speech generally. Um, and what absolutely stood out is that law on extreme porn is incredibly badly written and any lawyer worth their salt ought to be in any case. And yet to begin with, almost every lawyer was saying, just, just plead, just plead guilty. And people were going into court, putting their hands up to, be, to being guilty and getting often a custodial sentence. In one case, um, the judge made some very disparaging remarks about a uh, defendant. Um, but a, a, a solicitor said something like, um, yes, uh, one can see that you could only have downloaded these images for one possible purpose. The problem was that was a defence solicitor. And what on earth were they doing saying that they should be you know, trying to introduce doubt? And my suspicion, if anyone has dealt with these cases, is that you have young people who are themselves as, as you say, the multiple identity can be a problem, but equally I suspect some of these people are themselves not clear where their identity lies, Absolutely. whether they're transitioning, and they've got a rushed defence lawyer, and they're not really getting to any sort of lawyer who's capable of helping them. Is that fair? I would think that's fair, along with combined with raging hormones. I'm, I'm not sure. I think that it may have more to do with 
a view of social media because I think that if you if you're running four different Facebook profiles, um, all of whom are meant to be different people, and you're then creating further profiles who are talking to your four profiles um, in order to lend them credibility. I think that there are certainly um, certainly some judges who are going to struggle when you say, oh, well, of course, I never, I never intended that to be understood as anything other than one person with a fluid identity. No, I can see that. I just think there's been, a, there's just been too many of these cases in recent years for me to feel, you know, um, the other thing that bothers me seriously about all these cases is for years and years and years, trans men in the process of transitioning have been having sex, consensual sex with partners who maybe have found out afterwards and slapped them across the face, or maybe found out before and done it absolutely consensually, totally, completely, or whose parents have then found out and then sort of done a step back and a step forward on it but it has been dealt with outside of the courts. Mm. And my feeling is that, particularly in the younger parties in these cases, these are not cases that should have ever gone to court. They should have been dealt with through you know, appropriate discussions, if necessary, a caution, you know, about it. But they weren't court cases as such. Um, and you know, I think that shows through particularly in Chris Wilson's case where you know, we, the court sees Chris as Chris. He's presenting as Chris even though he's only just had his first appointment at the gender identity clinic. You know, he's wanted to go there. They see him as somebody who's definitely going to become a man and so they give him a suspended sentence for some peculiar crime which doesn't exist. Well, but they struggle as a court to find the thing to you know, initially charge him with and then they actually see when he is, you know, he is convincingly somebody who wants gender reassignment, he's, you know, given a suspended sentence. Whereas, you know, when this happened to Jimmy Saunders back in 1991, I mean, there was not, e not even the public discussions nowadays we have about trans people at all. Um, and he was left with no recognition at all of the fact that he you know, had a referral to a gender identity clinic, you know, wanted treatment, that was completely ignored. And then it's also, you know, the other thing that flows into this is for years and years and years, people like me, like Jimmy Saunders, if you went to the books and you tried to read what somebody like you was, you were described as a butch lesbian. And the phrase used to be a stone butch dyke. <laughs> who you kept your clothes on when you had sex with a girlfriend and you gave her pleasure but you didn't see any for yourself. And that was the actual description of all these medical mm. textbooks. So I remember talking to Jimmy Saunders, uh, Jennifer actually, when she came out of jail um, after the sentence had been served for nine months and say, talking about what she wanted to do and what she was thinking about doing. But one of the things she said was, well, I got this book out of the library and it says people like me are called Stone Butch Dykes. And I said, yes, I know exactly when that book mm. was published. It was 1956, you know, and I read the same bloody paragraph and thought, oh God, that can't work because I like sex. <laughs> Unfortunately, but I was a person who liked sex with boys and girls. And so in fact, got thrown out of a gender identity clinic because of that. So you were torn completely by the whole set of rules about what it is to be gendered. I think it's really interesting now that we have so many young people in schools transitioning. The numbers of those who will go on a permanent transition, we don't know. But what we do know is that most of them, if they have pubertal blockers before going on hormone treatment, will not need anything like chest surgery. All of this, the, the, the primary things will they won't need beard removal or chest surgery to remove breasts or anything. It will only be a case of do they want genital surgery at that later stage. And genital surgery is still problematic. Anybody who has it is taking you know, their life in their hands and offering it up in the hope of something better. <laughs>